Bonjour à tous, welcome all, pour ceux qui vont avoir un side sandwich un peu en friendish aujourd'hui, parce qu'on est ravis d'accueillir Johanna Warner, qui est biologiste et chercheur au Colorado et donc spécialiste des PICA. Donc, welcome to you, Johanna, at the Observatory du Mont Blanc. We're glad to have other researchers from all over the world coming to CREA. Dans ce chalet Valo, on a aussi un petit rappel, vous connaissez tous quand même bien le, le CREA, CREA Mont Blanc, le centre de recherche sur les écosystèmes d'altitude. Donc on a toute cette mission d'étudier nos écosystèmes de montagne et notamment l'impact sur la flore et la faune et de diffuser et sensibiliser to awareness awareness on all the biodiversity with this kind of conference that we have to have you here. Dans, dans ce lieu où, comme vous savez, on a un beau projet de rénovation et, et on a des. Aujourd'hui, on vous demande. Alors, on vous demande souvent de participer, mais même sans argent, vous pouvez aider. Euh, il faut voter jusqu'au euh, 15 octobre. Euh, ouais, voilà. Ouais. Ouais. On peut même le faire plusieurs fois. Euh, ah ouais. Voilà, ouais. sur le site. Euh, et on a aussi euh, des euh, ouais. Pour avoir un soutien. Euh, non, c'est un vote. C'est juste un clic. Ah, ben, on peut le faire. Ah, ben, on le fait ensemble. Ah, voilà. Alors, on peut voter ensemble. Voilà. Voilà. <rire> J'ai pas d'ordinateur, mais c'est... Donc on peut trouver sur le site du Il y en a aussi des personnes qui nous suivent en ligne, donc on leur souhaite aussi la bienvenue. Merci, merci, merci à tous. Je parle un peu de français. Je parlais français couramment il y a 20 ans, mais maintenant, je n'ai plus l'habitude. Alors, je peux essayer de répondre à vos questions, si vous pouvez supporter... Mon accent. <laughs> um, may, I think that giving my whole talk in French is maybe a little too much for me. <laughs> so um, I will try to speak in slow English, but I have put some French um, subtitles on here also just to help out. So I'm really excited to be here today. I've, I've followed Crea on Instagram for many years now, and I think that there's some really fantastic work that's being done here, both in in terms of the science of alpine ecosystems and also engaging public audiences in this work. And those are both my interests as well. So I wanted to share with you though a little bit about myself before I get started because I think that it is an important part of how I got into this work and um, why I am doing what I am doing. So I grew up in Utah, um, in the Western US in the mountains. I had great style in skiing in the <laughs> 1980s. And um, I liked to be outside and I liked animals. And I liked science and math a lot and um, was very fortunate to have the opportunity to attend MIT, Peru University. Um, and there I changed my major three times before I finally decided to become a biological engineer. And so I studied math and engineering and I did an extra year of, of a master's degree where I was growing neuron cells, so brain cells in a tiny, tiny microfluidic devices, so very small channels. And um, that was really important work. Um, the ultimate goal was to try to help people who had neurodegenerative diseases where their brain cells start to degrade. But um, it, in the end, I was spending quite a lot of time in a cold, dark room by myself looking at things through a microscope. And so it just wasn't a very good fit for my personality. And so when I finished my master's degree, I took some time off and I went to New Zealand. Um, I worked on organic farms in New Zealand and I did a lot of backpacking and I got to walk on my first glacier. Um, and I feel like that experience really opened my eyes to this whole idea of interactions between humans and the environment and also how climate change is affecting alpine ecosystems. And so when I got back um, from New Zealand, I came back to Salt Lake, uh, I was living with my parents and I read a newspaper article about pikas and I discovered that this was a 
very, very cute <laughs> animal that lived close to my home. Um, they were being affected by climate change. And because they live in popular recreation areas across the Western US, um, I also thought that it might be a great way to start working with local communities about issues related to observing climate change in the mountains. Um, and I, I came from Utah, which is a very politically conservative part of the United States. And at that time, there was a lot of um, problems with just people who didn't even believe that this was happening, um, let alone how to study it. And so as part of that, I ended up um, developing a, a number of different citizen science projects, trying to help um, both kids and also other kinds of audiences to be able to observe pikas as a way of seeing the local changes in our own ecosystems. So. Um, and I continue that work. Um, I'm now a professor of biology in Grand Junction, Colorado. So there's a map of where Grand Junction is in the US. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so just a little roadmap for you, um, share with you a little bit about what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to give you guys a little introduction to pikas and to the citizen science work that I've done, um, since unfortunately you do not have pikas here. I'm then going to tell you about a little mystery that was described by a citizen scientist and a line of research that we might not have done were it not for observations of some of the volunteers. And then finally tell you a little bit about the future of PICA citizen science. Um, so just by way of background, PICAs are lagomorphs. This means they're related to rabbits and hares. They're found in the northern parts of Western North America here, and then there's about 32 different species that are in Asia, in the Himalayas and in um, parts of Siberia and parts of Japan. Um, they, unfortunately, do not have pikas here in the Alps, but actually there is a fossil genus of pikas, the Prolagus, that was once here, it was about 12 million years ago. Um, this, particular group of organisms went extinct probably due to natural climate change many millions of years ago, but there was one population that held out on the island of um, Sardinia. And in Sardinia, they are actually thought to have been driven extinct by Roman agricultural practices. So there you go. Um, <laughs> the um, pikas are about the size and shape of a pan of chocolat. <laughs> um, in, the, in America, I would say a potato, but your potatoes here are much smaller than the potatoes that we grow there. Um, and they're uh, quite a bit smaller than the species of, of lagomorphs that you have here, like your mountain hares. Um, so they're, they're about this big. And um, in a recent survey of, of United States mammal biologists, they also were voted the cutest mammal. So this is a highly scientific work that I bring to you, um, just in case you did not know. Um, they're also the only lagomorphs to call. So this you may not think of very often, but rabbits and hares, they don't make very much noise. Um, but pikas are quite vocal, and so I want to play for you what they sound like. Hopefully the sound works here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is a <laughs> Okay, I wish that I could take credit for this video, but I didn't have anything to do with it. But it was sent to me by many, many people at you know, the rounds on the internet. So um, I want to actually play for you what they sound like. <laughs> <laughs> Very cute. <laughs> All right, so pikas live in the mountains and they, they tend to have a restricted distribution. They live at high elevations in rock slides and boulder fields that I call we call talus. And just to sort of orient you to the western United States, there's Salt Lake, um, many major cities, and you can see that their distribution is largely in these higher elevation parts. Usually they're above about 2,500 meters or so. Um, and with the exception of one population that I'll tell you about that lives just outside of Portland, quite close to sea level. Um, and this distribution is thought to be limited by both a sensitivity to heat, so they can't tolerate warm temperatures, and they have kind of a limited ability to disperse between patches of habitat. So it's difficult for them to move between rock slides and boulder fields. Just, just a stupid question. No. We have marmots. Yes. Does the pike have anything to do with marmots in terms of 
Yes. And like being cousins or something like that. Yes. Well, so actually, I'm going to tell you about a story about pikas and marmots um, today. But marmots are squirrel, basically giant squirrels. They're related to squirrels. They're in the rabbit or in the rodent group. And pikas are more closely related to rabbits. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm going to I'm going to tell you about a marmot mystery. <laughs> okay. Um, so unlike many alpine mammals, and unlike marmots, um, pikas don't hibernate. And so there's not a lot of food to eat when, they're, when their habitat is all under snow. And so they get around this um, by spending most of their summer collecting a really large um, food cache. So a single pika, again, about the size of, of pan au chocolat, collects about 25 kilograms of plant material every single summer that they eat during the winter. And this requires about 13,000 trips to the meadow each summer. If you were to scale this into human terms, it would be like us amassing something like 2,300 kilograms of food um, and making 15,000 trips to the grocery store. And on each trip, carrying home four heads of cabbage in your mouth. <laughs> so I encourage you to go to the grocery store, you can look at the pan au chocolat, you can look at the cabbages, and I think it will give you a good a, um, feeling for how difficult it is um, for these animals. So of course there's some concern about how pikas are responding to climate change. Um, this is, a, and this comes largely from some work done by my collaborators. This is a map that I'm showing of the western U.S. Um, in the Great Basin, which is an area of the western United States where the, there is no water outlet. So all of the water in there just evaporates. It doesn't flow to the sea. And um, what they did was they went to um, a whole bunch of different sites where we have reliable records of historical occupation by pikas. So there were, as a museum specimen or some other reliable record, the pikas were there 100 years ago. And when they resurveyed these sites, they went to every single rock slide within three kilometers of the original detection. And what you can see is that about 40% of these sites no longer have pikas. And then they did some work looking at why are those sites the ones that don't have pikas. And that they found is that the extinct sites tended to have warmer summers and a reduced winter snowpack. So what we think is happening here is that the pikas don't, they won't just run around and overheat until they die, but they will instead restrict their activity. They'll stay below the rocks where it's cooler. And then during the summer, what are they not doing? Collecting their food, right? They're not making all of their trips to the grocery store to bring back their cabbages. So they are, you know, then during the, the winter when there's less snowpack, they actually are ironically exposed to colder temperatures because the snowpack helps to insulate the temperatures in the rocks. They kept it quite close to zero degrees, but it's obviously, as you know, much colder than zero degrees in the, in the mountains in the winter. And so um, as a result of these declines, there have been a number of groups that have um, tried to engage public audiences and citizen scientists into helping to monitor pikas. And it turns out that this species is actually perfect for citizen science. They're active during the day. Um, they are easy to identify and observe, and they live in clearly well-defined habitat. They also don't appear to be affected by human observers, which means that if they're present, then you're very likely to see or hear them. And so this is a big advantage when working with volunteers. Um, and lastly, of course, they are, um, and very importantly, they're charismatic. They live in beautiful mountain areas that people like to go recreate, and they're very cute. So they're fun to watch. So at least 11 different groups have in the past been collecting data on, on pikas and their distribution. And this is just sort of a little map of some of the, those observations um, as of a couple of years ago. So I'm going to tell you today, uh, um, mostly these are the three groups that I've really been a part of helping either to start or to, to contribute to as a scientific advisor <clears throat> and, and doing trainings and stuff. Um, I'm going to tell you today a little bit about some data that we've collected with Cascades Pika Watch, and then uh, at the end I'll tell you a little bit about some of the cool things that are happening with the Colorado Pika Project. Um, but if you have questions, I'm also happy to tell you about Uintas Pika Watch, which was a um, partnership with students and in the seventh grade. So for I think you guys that would be the Sankyum um, is the same age. So a big part of my PhD research was working on this, this unique population that lives right here on the, the border between Oregon and Washington 
in what's called, it's along the Columbia River in an area called the Columbia River Gorge. And the pikas in the Columbia River Gorge live near sea level, so they're very, very low elevation, much lower than what we would expect based on what we know about their um, association with cold temperatures. And so while I was there trying to understand why the pikas were living in this place, I got connected up with a big group of folks that were interested in um, pikas in the gorge and they were interested in citizen science. And so I actually helped to found this project that we called Cascades Pika Watch. Um, this is a huge collaboration with other scientists. There are land managers. There are some teachers involved in this. There are um, some conservation biologists or um, conservation organizations. Um, and then there's also, it's housed at the Oregon Zoo. And so we also collaborate a lot with the Oregon Zoo. And at its core, this project basically engages volunteers in doing what we call sitting surveys, where they hike to a trail, sit or stand for 20 minutes and look for pikas, and then record what they see and what they hear. So we've been doing these surveys since about 2013, kind of, we would say opportunistically. So just whenever it was um, convenient for volunteers. But this group really sprung into action in 2017 because there was a big major fire called the Eagle Creek Fire that actually burned most of the pikas distribution in this really unique habitat. And so we got some extra funding from the Forest Service to be able to try to go do some much more um, careful and systematic work with the volunteers trying to understand how this fire might have affected this species. So um, we ran this program in 2018 and 2019, and a big part of um, my contribution was helping to select study sites that would be um, both a sort of good, strong scientific design, but also that would um, be accessible and fun for volunteers to be able to go visit. And um, so that's a map of those projects there. And then of course, during uh, the pandemic, everything kind of had to shut down. And so I spent uh, quite a bit of time trying to develop some virtual resources to help support our volunteers to continue their observations during the pandemic. Um, I have some background in film editing, and so I produced some videos for how, you know, reviewing some of the core skills, how to identify pikas, how to navigate using a smartphone app. Um, and then I developed, this is one of, a thing that I'm very proud of. <laughs> um, I developed these very cool spreadsheets that um, automatically update and provide volunteers with a list of the when each site was surveyed. So this is the, the site name. Um, and this, this spreadsheet actually reads the data set that volunteers generate as they submit data. And that spits back if that site has been surveyed this year, how many times it's been surveyed, what was the most recent date that it was surveyed. And it also reads a, um, a file that lets volunteers know if there are any issues re related to access or safety or whether or not they can get into those sites. Um, so if anybody's interested in this, I. Um, I think that it's something that's pretty useful that could be transferable to a lot of projects, and I'm happy to share more about that. This year, we finally got the go-ahead to bring back a full in-person training, and so in May of this past year, I traveled out to Portland and um, led uh, four different in-person trainings that looked like this where we um, taught volunteers, both new and returning, how to identify pikas um, and where, how to like, use these online resources. Um, we also had an online training in case that worked better for folks, especially if they weren't able to travel to the zoo in Portland to attend the trainings. And then after being trained, the volunteers would choose the sites that they wanted to survey from our map. Uh, and we gave them some descriptions and a GPS coordinate so that they could find the site. They would go to the site, um, look and listen for pikas for 20 minutes, and then report back what they found. So I want to share you, with you just a little bit of data um, from this project. Um, we had 28 different sites where we had really reliable observations from all every single season. And so I'm just showing you data from those 28 sites because it means that the comparisons are apples to apples, right? They're, it's showing the percent occupancy from the same sites. So before the fire, about 82% of those sites had pikas, and you'll see that there was this really thick layer of moss on the rock slides. 
part of my research was showing that this moss was actually really important as both a food source for pikas and um, also helped to keep the temperatures under the rocks much cooler than we would expect. And you can see that after the fire, there was a big change in the habitat. They, we lost a lot of trees and a lot of vegetation. And with that, we also saw a reduction in the number of pikas that we found. This is the year immediately following the, the fire where we lost pika occupancy at a lot of these sites. However, um, it's now been about six years since the fire. And so when I was there last fall, um, you can see how this site has sort of transformed. Um, it will take many, many years for this moss cover to grow back. The moss is very, very slow growing among plants. But what you can see is that here all around the rock slide, there's that fire actually stimulated the, the growth of very good, nutritious um, grasses and wildflowers that are also important food resources for pikas. And so with that, it seems that the pika populations are recovering. So you guys are actually the first people to see this <laughs> result. Um, and it's just from so far this season, our volunteers are gonna continue until the end of the month. And then we'll have a big season wrap up event um, in a couple of weeks. And what we can see is that this year, actually we found the most pikas at um, these sites that then we found uh, in any year before since before the fire. And so the pika populations are coming back um, after this fire and our volunteers are really um, critical in helping to document this important population recovery. Okay, yes. Where are they coming back from? Um, so I think that there are some places, some sites where they are still persisting. And so those are probably the sort of a source population that then it's just taking some time for them to make it from those sites into some of the areas where they may have been lost from the fire. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? Do they like communicate between each other between the sites? Like mm -hmm. to know that, for example, like the others have been lost and that they can migrate there if you're saying it's hard for them yeah. to migrate? How would they know that? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but I, but that's, uh, it's interesting that you say that because I had a student and um, some of my volunteers who have, have uh, ask the same question. Um, and I think it seems very reasonable that if you're sitting there and you're wondering where to go next and you hear somebody over there, you might be like, I'm going to go over there. <laughs> so um, I think that's definitely quite possible. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. Can it be also that uh, they died from the fire, so the population decreased? Yes. I think that that's probably what happened. Um, I think it's less likely that they died during the fire than that after the fire, there was nothing to eat, right? And so um, we had temperature sensors in this um, in the, this rock slide here, and during the, like during the fire, when this moss was burning um, about a meter below the surface, it was only about seven degrees Celsius during the fire. During the fire, yeah. So um, I think that there's some ice down like deep down below the rocks that helps to keep the temperature um, quite cool. So they probably could survive the fire in terms of the temperatures, but then you come to the surface and there's nothing to eat. And so then I don't know exactly what happened. Have you yeah. noticed any migration towards uh, humans uh, because of the uh, bad change? Because they're not very uh, flattened? Yeah, I haven't. Not especially, but that's a great idea and something that I think would be really interesting to look at. Um, and we could get at that with our data in terms of looking at where we find them in different years. So, not yet. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, I want to return to this distribution of projects and I want to share with you a few ways that, that PICAs, uh, that these volunteer citizen science projects have really advanced our understanding of the species. And then I'll share with you this little mystery that we have been trying to um, have been trying to solve. Um, so there are a couple of things that I think wouldn't have been possible if it weren't for volunteer-generated data. Um, in 2019, the the all of the points that you see on this map, um, which are volunteer detections of pikas, were actually used amongst a, a larger data set in um, trying to understand 
how this species associates with climate across its range, because we're seeing these declines due to climate change in parts of their range, but not in other parts. And so um, these, these data actually were really, really important because this region here in Montana um, has been very poorly studied by scientists, but very there's a very rich citizen science program that has been run out of the Craighead Institute in Bozeman, Montana. And so I think that was a nice example of how these kinds of projects were really um, important in trying to answer big questions about this species. Um, in addition, there are a number of very unusual things that I, volunteers have found about the species that I think professional scientists might not even think to look for. And so a great example is that in that Montana study, um, there was a volunteer who reported seeing a black pica. And they just came back and said, I saw a black pica. And the scientists who ran that study were like, Okay, really <laughs> black pica, we're gonna go check it out. But actually <laughs> it was a black pica. <laughs> and um, and this has led to some they actually were able to um, trap this pica and collect some samples and then release it. Um, and it lived for six years, I think. Um, it was very easy to identify. Um, and uh, it has led to some very interesting studies of, of melanism and, and coat color variation and the genetics that underlie that in the species that wouldn't have been possible had somebody not reported back. Um, likewise, in a different project, there were volunteers that observed pikas building their hay piles in trees, like hollow tree cavities and in piles of downed logs. And I think that that actually was very interesting because the trained scientists would never have even thought to look for pica sign off of the rocks because everybody knows that they only live in rocks. Um, and so I think that this sort of out of the box thinking has actually really led to some very interesting lines of inquiry um, that we wouldn't have looked for otherwise. So um, with that, I want to sort of switch gears here and tell you another story about a line of research that, again, um, we are, are undertaking now but might not have were it not for the help of a citizen scientist. So I told you I would tell you a little bit about marmots. And there's an observation that um, we have seen occasionally but not ever really known exactly what was going on here which is that sometimes in um, the, the pica hay piles in their winter food stash, we find a lot of marmot poop. Um, and there are a couple of different things that could be going on here. But first, I just want to sort of give you a comparison. The species of marmot that we have here is a different species than what you have um, in the Alps. The yellow-bellied marmot you'll see is about roughly the same um, size uh, as the alpine marmot, but it tends to live at slightly lower elevations, probably because we're at a, or sorry, at higher elevations because we're at a lower latitude. And so to find the same kinds of climate, it has to go a little bit higher in the mountains. Now, um, we've seen many times in, on camera traps that we've put on pikas, a uh, very serious crime. Um, and this is actually a, just a short clip of a, um, this marmot was in this hay pile for about a minute and stuffed its face and then ran away. <laughs> and so uh, it's, I say, Arsene Lupin, Marmot Cambrioler. I'm a big Arsene Lupin fan. <laughs> um, and uh, and that, that marmot actually came back many, many times um, to the same hay pile and, and nearly emptied it. And then the pica came back and was very sad. Um, but sometimes, oops, when the marmots are there, they leave behind a, a, a treat. So while stealing from, from pikas, <laughs> this is a, what I call the direct deposit hypothesis <laughs> for, how, for how marmot scat might end up in pika hay piles. Um, but actually, it was uh, one of the citizen scientist volunteers who um, made the first formal observation that pikas were actually collecting marmot scat sometimes on purpose, in spite of the fact that they were being stolen from the marmots, um, and putting it in their hay piles in what seems to be a very specific way. So Ross Gorman is a um, retired economist who likes to spend his time um, photographing animals, and he actually published this photograph of a pika collecting and storing a piece of marmot scat in its hay pile. 
And so, um, again, we weren't quite sure how much of it was deliberately collected versus, um, versus left by marmots um, or sort of incidentally collected. And so this has led us to, uh, I think, what I think is quite an interesting line of research, which is why our pipe is doing this. <laughs> um, we have a couple of different hypotheses. Um, we think that we thought first perhaps there was an effect of putting the scat in there that affected the way that the plants reserve over the winter. Um, we also thought that perhaps the, the marmots forage on a much larger area than the pikas, and so it could be that in, they are getting the benefit of a larger variety of like you know minerals and salts and micronutrients than what they might be able to get from their plants that are close to their homes. Um, we're also looking at whether they might have something to do with the gut microbes, that they are getting good gut microbes by eating somebody else's scat, or potentially that they're actually eating it for overwinter nutrition. So, uh, hmm? And the answer is? Um, we don't know. <laughs> I'll cut to the chase. We don't know yet. But I'm going to tell you, show you a little bit of data um, from the, these first two hypotheses, and we're still working on everything else. So you guys also are the very first people to see this, um, it, the, these exciting results. So we wanted to know if marmot scat affected preservation of the hay piles. And so what we did was we created a bunch of artificial, small, fake hay piles. And um, so we had 32 different bags that we, there are these little mesh bags, we put in there fresh plants, the same species that we find in pica hay piles, and half of them got marmot scat and half of them didn't. And we put them in these little wire cages to prevent them from being stolen by marmots um, and, or whoever, um, over the last winter. And so we collected them this past spring at four sites in Colorado. And this was, uh, you know, something that we were sort of doing as scientists, but we worked with local landowners and actually involved some citizen science participation in this project as well. Um, when we got these back, we dried them up and we calculated the percent of the mass rem remaining. And then I sent out these samples to have the nutrients analyzed. And so those are still in progress, but we do have some preliminary results. So first thing that we found is that no, <laughs> the scat does not really affect the overwinter preservation. So here on the y-axis, you're looking at the percent of the mass of the plants that were remaining in the spring when we got the box back. Um, and you can see that the plants that were exposed without the scat versus with the scat, there was no difference um, between them on average. However, one thing that I think is quite exciting is it seems that marmot scat contains about three times more um, salt than the fresh plants that the pikas are eating, and that um, after exposure, the, the um, hay contains somewhere around nine times more salt if it was left out over winter with the scat than without the scat. Um, so, if this turns out to be true, this is a very small sample size. I only have two replicates of each <laughs> of these so far. Um, and so, but if it turns out to be true, this could be actually quite an exciting finding um, because we know that pikas are very salt limited. So this is a picture of a pika licking my stepson's shoe in 2020. And this is from this past summer. The same pika came just beelined uh, out of the talus to go lick my stepson's shoe, the same same pica, same different shoe, same teenager. Um, <laughs> and then he spent some time licking his shoe and licking his water bottle, and we see this quite frequently, um, that they will lick rocks that we've touched, and we think that it has to do with the salt from the sweat on our hands. And I can attest that his shoes are quite sweaty. <laughs> so the fact that they that they the their food when it was left out with the with the poop was so much higher in salt could be if that turns out to be true could be a very um, exciting answer um, to this question and a big benefit to pike is. So again we don't know the answers yet but look at how cute this pika is with a little turd in its mouth. <laughs> but I, I did not understand what is the uh, how come the hay has more salt. Is it that it preserves better the salt that is? Yeah. So the plant, yeah. So the, the the scat has more salt than the plant than the plants. But when you expose the this the plants with the with the poop, 
it seems like there's a lot more salt in and it. Where does the salt come from? So that's a good question. And I think probably from the scat, like it may just sort of like get mixed in there. That's my guess. Um, it could also be like that there's something kind of funny going on with the, that it, like, this is in terms of the percent of biomass, right? And so if if there were certain nutrients that decay faster it's around the salts or not, then it could make it look like it's much higher. So does that make sense? Okay. So it'd be like making compost. Yeah. Right. Is it, so yeah, it's like it ferments and then sort of right. releases different right. salts. Yeah. Salt. yeah, it could be that it's fermenting. It could be like adding nutrients through compost. And so we have the, the rest of the samples I will get. I only had enough money to send out two, <laughs> um, but I'm going to get more money and then I'm going to send out the rest of them this year. So maybe you'll have me back in a year and I'll have more <laughs> stories <laughs> for you. Any other, other questions? Okay, so I, I want to share with you here just as we wrap up a little bit about some of the challenges that we faced with PICA citizen science and then some of the things that we're looking to do to help make this um, better for people and for PICAs. So um, it, one of the challenges I feel like that, I has, that I've been really interested in trying to solve and maybe you guys face this here as well is that it can be very difficult with citizen science projects to reach audiences that are kind of not the people who um, are already well educated, who already value science and who are well off enough that they have extra time that they can volunteer on these projects. Um, and it can be much more difficult to engage groups that are a little bit more diverse. And so we see this in, you know, the, the groups that we work with that we tend to have volunteers who come to our project who, again, are already pretty well educated and they already value science. Um, so, and indeed, if we return to this distribution of PICA citizen science generated data, what you can see is that this, in addition to reflecting the distribution of PICAs, also reflects the distribution of volunteers who um, are able to participate in these projects, um, who come from either kind of big cities like Denver or Portland, um, or who come from wealthy small mountain towns. Um, uh, or who are visiting national parks in, in popular areas. And in fact, this distribution is exactly opposite of the places where we've seen the biggest declines in PICA populations. And so the map that I showed you from the PICA declines that have been the strongest tend to be in these kind of interior, very small, isolated mountain ranges um, with limited amount of habitat at very, very high elevations. And so I've been really interested in trying to understand how we can better reach folks who live in these areas to help keep an eye on the, you know, potentially the most vulnerable um, pike of populations. So one of the approaches that I've taken with this has been to work with school groups. Um, and this has a couple of extra benefits that students um, that participate in these projects, if you can get um, transportation with the school, it provides an experience that they might not otherwise be able to, to have because you get to bring them up to the mountains, they get to observe the pikas, and they get to contribute to real science. Um, and in doing so, I think it also helps them to develop an identity as a scientist quite early on and to you know, get to know an actual scientist as, as young people. However, a limitation of this is that it requires the teachers have to really be very, very invested in, in this kind of project. And so I've been very fortunate to work with a couple of teachers in Utah and um, one teacher in Oregon who have just been like, let's do this, we're going to do it, <laughs> and have devoted a bunch of time and resources um, to uh, help bring students up to monitor PICAs. But it's really intensive work, and um, it requires a lot of investment on their time. And so what we wanted to do was kind of think bigger about ways to engage more people in citizen science. And for that, what we did is decide to harness the huge <laughs> data collection device um, that all of us carry around in our pockets and to develop an app. So we have a mobile app that it, I don't even want to talk about how long it took this to happen. <laughs> many years. Um, and uh, uh, anyway, I can tell you more about that if you're interested. But um, it was quite a journey. But just this past year, we released 
this app, it's called PICA Patrol. You can get it too if you want, but you don't have PICAs here. Um, <laughs> but if you come to the United States or you go to Asia and want to report PICA sightings, we'd love to hear about it. Um, and the, this is a mobile app. It's the first dedicated PICA mobile app. Um, the app uh, automatically records your location and your date and time, so it makes it as easy as possible to submit an observation. And then within the app, you can record sounds and you can take photographs and <laughs> automatically attach those, along with an e a short little survey form to tell us about the observation of what you saw. Um, the app also includes embedded training materials, so if somebody doesn't know about PICAs or they forget what they sound like, they can pull up the PICA patrol. Sometimes um, it also helps the PICAs will call back more frequently if you play a call and then they'll, they'll return a call. Um, I don't think that they actually like think that they're communicating, but I think that they're like, hey everybody, somebody's making a weird PICA sort of sound here that you should know. Um, and so this is, represents a tremendous amount of, uh, of work to build and test and push this out. Um, but uh, it is, I think we're very proud of it and we're very excited. Um, and so you can see here, this is just a quick map that I downloaded just before I left on this trip. You can see that the, the app was pretty widely used in the summer. We had over 2,000 downloads of the app, and then of the people who downloaded it, there were about 350 observations that were submitted so far. And keep in mind that in most places, the PICAs aren't accessible, especially this year we had record snowpack across much of the western U.S., and so they actually weren't accessible until mid-July. So this is about um, two months of data collection. And so we can see that definitely the, the places where we're seeing the most use of the app are, are the two vol um, citizen science projects where we've actually pushed it actively out to volunteers. But we are starting to see some observations from this interior area kind of trickle in. And that will be a big focus of our work in the coming years is trying to get some media attention and raise awareness of this app for um, these more rural communities that live in these areas where we're seeing these declines. So with that, um, that is all that I have for you today, but many of these people have contributed a tremendous amount. Um, science is a team sport, and um, there are lots of people who have contributed to the data that I've shown you today. But um, I think that I have some time, and I'm happy to look forward to talking to you guys and answering some questions. If you have them. Um, yes. It's a bit random, but um, are pipers related to lemmings, the guys who live in like so they look similar. Yeah, they do look similar. Um, the lemmings are rodents, so okay. they're they're more closely related to mice, rats, or squirrels or marmots, okay. and pikas are more closely related to rabbits. But rodents and rabbits, like at the next mm -hmm. level of organization, are very closely related. So they're more closely related to lemmings than they are to us, but <laughs> less closely related to lemmings than they are to hares. Okay. Yeah. Yes. How come you were able to focalize on Parker? Uh, we in front have uh, associations where mm -hmm. we look for everything. Yes. Uh, uh, chamois, marmots. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, suddenly you talk about one, one specific species. little yeah. animal. Yeah. And then you do all this about it. About, what about the others? Yes. <laughs> I know. I would say there's. A couple of reasons for that. One is that um, I really like pikas, <laughs> and so I have been able to make a space for myself in doing that. Um, and uh, and so I um, so I've done that because I like. It. Um, but also, I think that there are a lot more people right now in the U.S. who are studying other species, and in the academic institutions in the United States, it's not. It's not rare for scientists to study one taxon. It kind of depends. Some scientists take sort of a broad view and they focus on the questions. Um, and then they, they look at those questions with lots of different species. And some scientists focus on species. And then they, and for me, um, I like, I like pikas. <laughs> I like the mountains. And I like the field parts because it's kind of like getting my job to be what I would do for fun anyway. And so that has been a benefit. Are you the only scientist who is specialized in pikas? No. Or are you a couple of, there, I mean, there's lots of people obviously, but maybe they have other Yeah, there are probably 
30 of us. Oh, wow. And we have a, in the US. In the US. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's a handful more of people who study species in, in Asia. Mm -hmm. um, we have a conference. It's called the North American Pika Consortium. <laughs> I am the chair of the Education, Outreach, and Citizen Science Subcommittee. <laughs> kind of a big deal. But what you said in the beginning is you try to link pikas to climate change. Right. That's the objective, right? Right. Yeah. And that, so that's the other piece of that question is that this is a species that could be a, um, in many parts of their distribution, they could be a great indicator species. And so, ha like, the places where the pikas are declining, this could be telling us about the conditions that will later affect all of the other species as well. So, I just want to make sure it's clear that I care about other things. <laughs> <laughs> also, I just really like pikas. Yes? You're picking up on Pascal's uh, question. Are you part of a network of citizen science that, uh, and is there a demand from your citizen scientists to actually monitor other species or... Yeah. So in our in our app, we have um, some places where you can put in um, other species that you observe at the location. And so some of the groups that were help that helped to come together to build the app also run citizen science projects with um, bats and um, ptarmigan, which I think is quite similar to your um, lago like like with and um, the um, a species of finch, the red. Great, great crown, rosy finch, um, and marmots. Um, and so, if you observe those and you click on that button, uh, there will be an additional form that sort of pops up and asks some questions about what you saw on that species. Um, but yes, there are a lot of there are a lot of places that there are a lot of places that that do like many more species in the same observation, but. With the app, what we really wanted to do was to try to draw people's attention to this to this one species because you, if, if you try to allow people to submit everything, then you kind of lose the depth on any one thing. Mm -hmm. so, so, do you think there's a demand from your participant to go to other species? I mean, does it trigger anything, any other scientific observation yeah. for your participants? Or? I hope so, and that's actually something that we're going to, we are doing some studies, uh, like an educational, like, you know, sociology sort of study with our Ca Cascades Pika Watch participants this year. And so in a couple of weeks when we go there for the wrap up event, <coughs> we're actually going to be asking questions about that as well and about if it if if particip how participating in this project helped them to um, potentially take other actions to learn about other species or to like change to have more pro environmental or conservation action kinds of things. So I hope so. We'll see. <laughs> so, so I have a bit of a side question. Yeah. If you look at your map, mm -hmm. you have a um, lot of Indian Native, Amer Native American reservations there. Yes. In like the four corners. Yes. Yeah. You have Navajo and Hopi. Yeah. So the question is, did you try to involve them? Do they care? Do they have other things to worry about? Yeah. <clears throat> That's a really good question, and I think it's a very important a really important one. Um, we have not, we haven't worked, I have not worked with them directly because um, I don't yet have the relationships yet to go. And I think it's a little bit problematic for somebody like me to charge in and be like, hey, let me teach you about pikas, you know, um, when they have really deep knowledge of the landscape and of the species. Um, but I have a collaborator who's working on making those connections, and she um, has some. An indigenous background herself, and so we're we are working on that because I think it's very important. But I think it's also very important to do it, you know, the proper way. The proper way, yeah, respectfully, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't uh, what you said at the beginning. Are you part of an association, or do you receive some support, financial support? Mm -hmm. Do you participate to some projects? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes. To all of those things, I, I I am mostly a university professor, um, and so I do so I do a lot of this research sort of on my own time um, because I think it's important. Um, but I, I do receive some grants and funding from the university or from outside of the university, 
And the, this Cascades Pika Watch project has been mostly funded with a grant from the Forest Service, the U.S. Forest Service, which manages all of the national forest lands. Um, and they had a, a program that supported the, um, the mm -hmm. involvement of citizen scientists, volunteers, and it was particularly with wildfire. And so that's how we were able to get a lot of support for the Cascades Pika Watch program. But um, it's been a lot of like small grants here and there to try to make everything happen. But yeah, I don't think that we have necessarily quite the same kinds of associations, mm -hmm. um, perhaps that you have here. Yeah. How do you disseminate all the results uh, in the direction of the system scientists you work with? Yeah. So I'm going to Portland in two weeks um, to, to lead a, a wrap-up event for all of our volunteers that participated this year. And so um, I will give them a presentation. But then for people who can't come, I write up a, a summary of the results and send it to them like an email newsletter every year um, so that they can see what their uh, efforts have contributed to. And then um, for the people who have been very involved, I also actually have involved citizen scientists, volunteers who have been very, very involved in scientific publications as well. So we're in presenting results at a conference. Yeah. Yeah. It seems like there's a pretty active community mm -hmm. of them. How did you start that community? Like at the picture you showed, it seemed like the room was pretty full. There was lots of people. How did you get that going? Like uh, this situation yeah um, yeah so I didn't I didn't I didn't get it all going <laughs> um, but I, what I have I think done is help to when when I started working with pikas it was in 2009 was the very first pika conference <laughs> and it was just as I was starting my graduate work and so I, I went to this and one of the things that I noticed is that there were a lot of these people that were like, let's do citizen science with pikas, but they were all inventing the wheel by themselves. Mm -hmm. And so nobody was using shared protocols or data infrastructure or forms or pro you know anything. And so I think that um, I, I was involved. This was me. That was part me. I, this was existed before me, but I work with them now because I live, to, live in Colorado. Everybody else here has is completely independent of me. Um, but I think what I have done is help get everybody around the table to start communicating about how we're doing things so that we can learn from each other's experience and not have to all solve the same problems by ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. So, but I think that this speaks to that, um, you know, at that time, there just, there wasn't, a, like a lot of the, the conversation about climate change in animals was like polar bears, polar bears, polar bears. <laughs> like it was all about the polar bears. And I think that I feel like one of the things that all of this has resulted in is a little bit more local awareness about like species that live near us, not near you, unfortunately. But you know, yeah. And have you noticed any that's the social benefit of this, like uh, citizen science meeting and going to the field together, or does that create interaction? Yeah, definitely. And so during that was definitely something during the pandemic. We did a lot of, you know, trying to check in with volunteers, and and I I did a lot of surveys to try to find out what volunteers like wanted from this program mm -hmm. in its rebirth um, after the pandemic, so that we could make sure that it was something that they would like. And th in those surveys, it was super clear that the participation was so much more special and meaningful when it was social. And so people, there were, I, I heard stories of people who met their best friends on a Pika Watch hike. Um, <laughs> you know, I haven't yet found a couple that got married <laughs> on a Pika Watch hike, but you know, maybe. <laughs> um, and and they that people, you know, during the pandemic when it was all sort of, here's an online list of sites, go there by yourself, we saw a big drop in participation. Mm -hmm. um, there were a lot of people who just were like, that's not that fun. So, <laughs> and yeah. do they have a way to communicate between them? So yes, so we have, um, we have a volunteer coordinator and um, we have a newsletter, but we also have set up some like monthly social <laughs> events. So there's like, like a happy hour um, and you know, everybody can get together and, and drink beer and talk about pikas. 
Um, and, and then we also have a find a friend form. <laughs> so if you're looking for somebody to go hiking with, you can submit a, you can submit a, a your profile or whatever. You can't do it without the, with the, with the application. Through the application. No, not yet. But that's a good idea. Maybe we should have a, a friends feature. The the app developer that we work with. I did not do any of the coding on the app, but our developer they call it. It's a, a thing in app development that they call feature creep, where you make an app and then suddenly you have 15 different other ideas of things that you want in the app, and they they are very like no, <laughs> but but maybe for next the next round, yeah. It is 1.30, one thirty. Question, ça va? Le problème. Thanks a lot for I think sharing your passion yes. with because now we want to see the real yes. ones. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. 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 You didn't break them. No. I didn't bring one. They, they don't travel well. They don't travel well. Yes. 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 But but then this made it much easier for me to tell my job that I was going to be gone. You might be gone already, but uh, yeah. the prochain yeah. instance yeah. will be yeah. the Sunday set. Journey of the discovery of the spot, notamment Anaïs et Colin. Donc, pour ceux qui sont là, on aura aussi le sans son but. C'est quoi le sujet? Le samedi 7, c'est sur les sciences participatives avec un focus, voilà, ça sera Colin, sur les données scientifiques du programme Compte Compte, de suivi des grenouilles, donc plusieurs font partie. Euh, Mais vous pourrez passer aussi un peu quand vous voudrez, euh, dans la journée, ça sera un peu porte ouverte de 10h à 16h. Et on pourra inventer un nouveau protocole voilà, ce voilà, ne sera pas les pika à patrol, mais on a des... Fra 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 Fra